presentation up there. We don't care what color. Okay. 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 All right, that's what it is. Thank you, Jarvis. Oh, wait. All right. So, welcome to the second African Diaspora Studies Graduate Forum. Okay. Um, very pleased to be here and you know unite again um, in this capacity. We have two powerful presentations today. Rob Connell. We'll be presenting his work in progress entitled Higher States, Research Ethics and Ethnographies of Conflict in Maroon, Jamaica. Rob is a six-year PhD candidate in the Department of African American Studies here at Berkeley. He earned his Bachelor of Environmental Studies degree with honors and a minor in political science from York University in Canada in 2009 and earned his master's degree here in African American Studies in 2012. His dissertation subject examines the legacy of dual ethnogenesis in 21st century circum-Caribbean maroon conflicts over resource extraction and sovereignty. Specifically, Rob is investigating the politici politicization of Jamaican and Surinamese maroon communities given contemporary challenges to their self-proclaimed sovereignty through state-sanctioned resource extraction in the context of maroon ethnic distinction. This research, research engage, engages primarily with Caribbean history ethnic multiplicity within the African diaspora, political ecology, the politics of autonomy, and development studies. Rob's parallel research interests include participatory research methods, African critical theory, and the function of utopia and radical imagination in the African diaspora. And we also have Professor Pichel. Professor Tiana Pichel will be presenting Exporting Racial Paradise, the Transnational Making and Unmaking of Brazil. Dr. Pichel is an assistant professor of African American studies at UC Berkeley. She's interested in the intersection of racial ideology, politics, and globalization in Latin America. Her work can be found in the American Journal of Sociology, the Du Bois Review, Souls, a critical journal of black politics, culture, and society, and ethnic and racial studies, also various edited volumes, as well as two forthcoming books. The first, Becoming Black Political Subjects, draws on ethnographic and archival methods to explore the shift in the 1990s from ideas of unmarked universal citizenship to multicultural citizenship regimes and the recognition of specific rights for black populations by Latin American states. And the second is an interdisciplinary volume, <coughs> Afro-Latinos in Movement, co-edited with Petra Rivera Redou, Rideau. Rideau, and Jennifer Jones, that explores transnationalism and blackness in the Americas. Professor Pichel is also a Ford Fellow and member of the American Political Science Association Task Force on Race and Class Inequality, as well as the steering committee of the Network of Anti-Racist Action and Research. So we will enjoy our presenters for the first 40 minutes or so, um, 20 minutes each, and then followed by question and answer. So please help me welcome Rob Connell. Thank you so much, my uh, esteemed colleague and uh, fellow Maroonist, um, Catherine. Uh, just shameless self-promotion, we'll both be speaking at the Maroon Conference uh, this May, uh, May 5th, is it? Yeah, in the Townsend Center, so please do come to that. It's actually at the Bancroft Oh, it's Bancroft. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, give us oh, your labor the whole, contract. Yeah, labor contract dispute, okay. Um, Anyways, I think this is a really timely moment um, for me to be discussing the ethnographic and methodological intricacies of my work. You know, five years ago, I was a first year um, new admit to the program, and you know the awe of being in Berkeley was starting to wear off a bit, and uh, starting to realize what a huge amount of work this was. And of course, as Catherine was saying, I had entered the program to study um, contemporary maroon communities, um, um, especially around the context of conflict with the state over resource extraction uh, in Jamaica. And I would later expand that to be a comparative study in Suriname. And I was so excited and couldn't wait to get into the field and you know this will mainly be about research design my talk today so I can't get a whole lot into um, the actual contours of that struggle but I'd be glad to field any questions on that in the Q&A. 
but just briefly, this is of course Jamaica. Um, Akampong, my research community, is around right there in the cockpit country. You can see it delineated here, which is a highland area of Jamaica that actually has the highest amount of endemism. That's a plant and animal species found nowhere else in the world. The, the highest amount of endemism in the Caribbean. And around 2006, the Jamaican government, along with the Aluminum Company of America, found that there was perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars worth of bauxite in this um, more eastern region of the cockpit country, the mining of which is uh, extremely destructive on any terrain that it happens. Um, and the Maroons caught wind of that and basically said if that mining goes through on their claimed territory, and they do claim this whole region as their Treaty 1 territory, um, it would be a state of war between the, their communities and the Jamaican government. So the stakes were very high. but. Back in spring 2011, every Wednesday, in fact, in this very room, at this very time, Professor Stephen Small in this 201B methods class would press me on how the hell I'm actually going to pull off this research. <laughs> Needless to say, the methodological challenges for my field work were vast. First, there was an almost complete dearth of secondary data detailing the experiences of Jamaican maroon polities during the period in question. As such, a great proportion of the evidence needed for the creation of both my historical and political data sets were dependent on interviews with the maroons themselves. Second, in designing these interviews, I was specifically seeking to gain insights into maroon political processes and strategies, community demographics, intracommunal power relations, and aspirations for their community, all very sensitive subjects. Compounding this was the fact that I was in the midst of a high stakes, potentially violent struggle over the future of Akampong. And third, although secrecy, evasiveness, and distrust of outsiders are typical barriers in almost any type of ethnographic research, maroon communities are particularly notorious for these traits. Maroon ethnographer Kenneth Bilby traces the genesis of this disposition to the legacy of the Maroon Wars in the 17th and 18th centuries, where betrayal and espionage were a constant threat to these communities seeking survival. And, you know, this apprehension clearly lives on in Maroon lore, and I have to say, even in the 21st century, that fear is not unfounded. Um, as part of my research in Kingston, the capital of Jamaica, I interviewed a high-level um, cabinet advisor to the Jamaican government about uh, um, involved in the Ministry of Mining and Economy. And I'm up in this huge high-rise building, sitting in front of his desk, handing him my IRB form, you know, preparing to tell him what this interview was going to be about. And he cuts me short and he's like, no, 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 I know what you're doing. I've been informed of your research here. And in fact, we find it um, very intriguing and of deep economic importance to Jamaica. You know, the Maroons have been chasing away all of our surveyors. We can't get up there. We don't really know what's going on in the community at all. So I want you to give me your research data right now. <laughs> oh, well, um, unfortunately, the University of California has very strict rules about the divulgement of, uh, of research data. And by the way, look at the time I have to go. So, so you know, this is, this is a very real conflict, and the stakes um, are quite high. Anyways, uh, back to 201B and this characteristic bluntness, uh, Professor Small warned me that even if I got this field research past the IRB, and that was a big if at that point, there was still a strong risk that I could show up in Akampong and the Maroons just wouldn't talk to me at all. Why would they? And there goes my dissertation. So I won't keep you in suspense. I did manage to pull off the dissertation out of this, uh, fortunately, and um, also managed to maintain the trust of my respondents. And I think now, with my field work complete, my writing underway, and the anticipation of graduating next year, I'd like to use this time to, to reflect on how well I fared in terms of data collection. No, sorry, data collection and ethnographic methodology. So, it was apparent to me early in my research design that I would need to consider my methodological approaches very carefully. I was also guided by the question of how to engage in decolonial and liberatory research. 
Now, my training taught me that trust and rapport with research respondents are more than problems to be resolved by specific sets of methodological <laughs> tactics, personal dispositions, or code of conduct, um, as important as they are. They also stand at issue as issues that must be addressed in the very paradigmatic foundation of field research itself. Through my previous degree in environmental studies and coursework in the environmental science policy and management department here at Berkeley, I became familiar with community-based participatory research, or CBPR. At its most fundamental level, CBPR challenges the epistemic monopoly of the outside expert as the only true source of knowledge, or as public health scholars Meredith Minkler and Nina Wallerstein write, CBPR turns on its head the more traditional applied research paradigm in which the outside researcher largely determines the questions asked, the tools employed, the interventions developed, and the kinds of results and outcomes documented and valued. Participatory research fundamentally is about who has the right to speak, to analyze, and to act. In their book, Partnerships for Empowerment, Participatory Research for Community-Based Natural Resource Management, Carl Wilson and colleagues identified three core elements for the design and evaluation of CBPR projects. One, the degree of community control. Two, reciprocal production of knowledge. And three, utility and action of outcomes for communities. And that is the degree to which outcomes are useful for taking action in order to affect social change. Mickler and Wallerstein add to these imperatives the systems development and local community capacity building, and the need for empowering processes through which participants can increase control over their lives and achieve a balance between research and action. Indeed, CBPR, C CBPR necessitates a particular focus on gender, class, race, and culture, especially within the research enterprise itself. I found this research paradigm very compelling. Indeed, it seemed to me a direct methodological application of what the esteemed science and technology studies scholar Donna Haraway calls situated knowledges. That is, a claim to knowledge from a specific, often subaltern, and acknowledged position which prioritizes the vantage point of subjugated groups. And of course, Patricia Hill Collins prioritized a similar approach to research within African American studies. I believe that CBPR meets the decolonial challenge of researching across difference by having academics put their methods in the service of subjugated communities, with a critical analysis of community aspirations and worldviews being at the very center of intellectual production. I noted that feminist philosopher Sandra Harding's program for strong objectivity presented several guidelines that dovetailed cohesively with CBPR. In particular, I aligned with Harding's exhortation that research starting off from the location of marginalized lives not only seeks to explain those lives, but also the micro and macro social order in which they are embedded. I strove to not only give an account of the dynamics of maroon politicization in light of the activities of extractive industry, but also how such a struggle adds to our understanding of neoliberal agendas in the peripheral world. However, I take geographer Laura Polito's challenge seriously that expository revelation is insufficient in itself for the engaged scholar because the mere telling of a story is not, in and of itself, a shift in power relations. As such, I am intrigued by political ecologist Louise Fortman's employment of Yvette Puerta's participatory research model that strives to strengthen the community through the research process itself. Towards that end, I thought that CBPR also addressed the vexing problem of reciprocity conducting field research, or when conducting field research. How could I approach this in my own research? Should I contribute to the maroon treasury as much money as I spent on my research, as Vine Deloria suggested? I mean, honestly, as a grad student in the 21st century, that was probably not going to happen as much as I would have liked to be able to do that. Louise Foreman suggests that paying in our own currency means giving to respondents whose knowledge we use full-blown academic credit for the form of co in the form of co-authorship. I am inclined to agree with Fortman's exhortation, but is that really enough um, to settle the matter of reciprocity? Ultimately, I concluded that conducting research which is relevant and above all useful to communities in struggle, research that in some way is shifts in the shifting of power relations, should be the goal of the engaged scholar. 
unfortunately, in the process of creating my prospectus and submitting it to the IRB, I was forced to conclude that a total CBPR approach was simply not possible. Although I continue to believe that CBPR presents a compelling alternative to the hierarchical methodologies still commonly employed in academia, the fatal flaw in CBPR seems to be the very fact that it pushes up against so many deep-seated practices in the academy. Indeed, CBPR largely jettisons institutionally expected sole authorship of, resource, of research uh, demonstrably designed, developed, and implemented by a single researcher, a move which is, ana which is anathema to career prospects. The longer research timeframes often inherent in CBPR, with the resulting increased need for increased funding, make CBPR largely out of reach to grad students and many professors for that matter. As Kim Talbert, one of my mentors and a former uh, professor in environmental science here at Berkeley put it, CBPR is largely impossible because the structures of the academy in its current state are not configured to support it. So the question remains, therefore, as to what, if anything, from the CBPR paradigm I could salvage for my own dissertation. I return once again to environmental studies, the cradle of CBPR, for examples of working participatory methodologies. During my search, I came across sociocultural anthropologist Roberto Gonzalez's book, Zapotec Science, an anthropological and political economic analysis detailing the sophistication of Mexican Zapotec agriculture as an embodied knowledge. It was the innovative participatory method employed to collect the data supporting its conclusions that were most fascinating for me, in that they represented a highly engaged approach to fieldwork, encapsulated by the term learning by working. Gonzalez's motto of learning by working entailed actually working in the fields under the guidance of Zapotec peasant farmers and playing in a traditional Zapotec music troupe. Through this, Gonzalez was able to build rapport and trust with his respondents, thus enabling a richer research experience and much deeper insights into his research topic. Um, how am I doing for time? Oh. So, in essence, learning by working is a highly engaged variant of participant observation, where the researcher participates in the daily toil of their research subjects in order to better learn about their lives. Learning by working emerged as a creative method for solving research problems akin to my own, although Gonzalez laments that it is actually rarely used within the academy today. Paramount among its benefits over CBPR is that while still encouraging a degree of community participation in the research process, it is the researcher themselves who must learn from the community, a situation that will inevitably inform the trajectory of research. The researcher is still able to conduct a sole authorship project within a, research, within a determined time frame, thus avoiding the confrontation with systemic, if unjustified, barriers to CBPR within the academy. Learning by working is an individual initiative, method, and disposition that the researcher can execute without requiring a high degree of good luck, money, powerful connections, or massive changes in these structures of universities. Secondarily, as attested by Gonzalez, learning by working can facilitate the researcher earning the trust of the community a vital need for my research project and the key for overcoming much of the secrecy and distrust I risked encountering in the interview process. <clears throat> Through the acts of solidarity and mutual aid, learning by working requires of the researcher, an intimate knowledge of the functioning of the community and the daily lives of its inhabitants can be garnered, while, reciprocally, the community members will have a much clearer idea of who the researcher is and what their intentions are, thus rendering the research process itself far more transparent. Ultimately, my efforts yielded 41 interviews and an eight-person focus group in the Maroon communities of Akampong, Jamaica, and the primarily Njuka Maroon region of Mongo in eastern Suriname. A total of 11 months were spent in maroon communities, including a preliminary research foray in Jamaica a year before my main field work in order to introduce myself and my work to the people of Akampong and cultivate contacts there. Even so, I spent almost a month in Akampong before anybody would talk to me at all. Um, Indeed, in Suriname, I was told in no uncertain terms that maroon villagers across the country routinely refuse to speak to academics on a matter of principle unless they're actually introduced uh, by somebody known to them. 
and fortunately I was able to cultivate such, uh, such contacts in the Maroon diaspora in Holland before arriving in Suriname. In Akampong, I first practiced learning by working by helping an elder herbalist, Carlton Smith, record his preparations and recipes in a booklet and arrange the printing of a few copies. And I'll pass this around. Uh, uh, the photocopy quality is not that good. The originals were much more glossy. <laughs> um, so by producing something of use to Mr. Smith and getting to know him better in the process, I was able to gain valuable insights into maroon environmental consciousness. I also attended two quarterly sessions of the Farmer Field Training School in Akampong, which allowed me to meet many of the active cash croppers, learning about their farming techniques, and discuss with them some of the ecological problems the community has been facing recently. And finally, in coordination with Sheldon Wallace, president of the Akampong Development Committee, I helped construct a website for Akampong actually run by community members themselves. In the course of pursuing these works, I found myself much better positioned to broach the more sensitive subject matter of governance structures, political dynamics, gender and class stratification, and tensions with the state. Furthermore, my engagement with the community in this manner allowed me to better understand the needs of the community and how my research could play a positive role in their struggle. Many in the Maroon leadership are anticipating a legal um, court battle uh, looming with the Jamaican state over their territory, territorial rights, and they requested that if there were any official maps that I had come across in my research that, uh, that I show them because they are systematically actually denied access to all that information in the Jamaican archives and the National Land Agency. So, sure enough, I actually did come across a few very pivotal maps, and uh, I'll conclude my talk here, but this on the left is the first known map of Akampong. You can't make it out here, but it dates back to 1757. Um, I found it in the National Library of Jamaica, and this was much, much more difficult to find, but this is the actual current cadastral map of um, cockpit country, and you can see the delineation as understood by the government of maroon lands here, which of course the maroons themselves contest, but such information is going to prove vital for any legal battle to have. And, um, and again, this was the first time anybody in Akampong had ever seen either of those. Mm. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs> to present here, but also apologize to Rob because we talked about doing, um, me doing a different presentation that would um, make more sense with his presentation because some of the communities that I do research in um, and with, um, actually there's some of the same issues and we've come to actually a quite similar place in terms of thinking about um, ethics and the politics of ethnography. Um, the reason I did not do that presentation is because I feel like people are going to have methods um, fatigue of me in the next few weeks because I'll be speaking at the D-Lab, I'm speaking in 201B, I'm speaking at your grad meeting at some point in the next two weeks, so I decided instead okay. um, to use this as an opportunity to present um, a, a new piece of um, kind of thinking about a new research project, which is equally about uh, methods in so much as it's at the beginning of the research design. And um, I'm just at that real point where I actually do want feedback, not like where, oh, thanks for the feedback, but it's already written, we're already <laughs> published, and all that sucks about it will continue to suck forever, right? So this is actually real research, like it, real time, I guess, is what I want to say. So I'm just going to start um, so that I don't go over. So the video for the song Beautiful by Snoop Dogg and Pharrell Williams was shot in Rio de Janeiro in the early 2000s. Just like most tourist videos, um, it was designed to entice visitors to Brazil. The video features white sand beaches, samba, scantily dressed Brazilian women, of course of different skin tones, sometimes with coconuts in their hand, sometimes without, and of course ball or soccer. 
What ties all these images together and what indeed seems to be making Brazil beautiful, as the title of the song suggests, is the country's unusually high degree of race mixture and its supposed kind of racial harmony. Also, as anthropologist Erica Williams reminds us in her new book on sex tourism in Brazil, the exoticism of the country's physical landscape is heavily imbricated with a racialized and sexualized view of all of the Brazilian people. So of course, Snoop Dogg and Pharrell were not the first people to discover a kind of racial utopia in Brazil. Um, the country's image as a model of race relations, um, a model of race relations in the world dates back to the early 20th century. Um, when a lot of different kinds of people began to write about Brazil as a place of harmonious race relations, including W.E.B. Du Bois, but also a lot of um, kind of so-called newspaper men from um, black newspapers at the beginning of the century. So we have people um, like Kelly Miller, but we also have um, Booker T. Washington and others that um, went to Brazil. And there's a great book that's actually looking at how they imagined Brazil when they went. And while some of these very same African-American intellectuals would actually later become disillusioned with Brazil's racial order, the country actually continued to be understood as an anomaly in a world of Jim Crow, of apartheid, and ethnic cleansing. So what was most fascinating, I think, to these observers of Brazil was that while the country shared a history of racialized slavery and colonization with its neighbor to the north, um, it seemed to have somehow overcome this brutal history. And so I was going to talk a little bit about um, Gilberto Freire, but I feel like I'm always talking about Gilberto Freire. But um, I think the most important thing here to think about is that Gilberto Freire um, was, is a, 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 the kind of icon of um, the so-called ideology of racial democracy in Brazil. He wrote in the early 1930s. Um, and he saw his work as really racially progressive. He um, came in at a time when eugenics was in full force in Brazil, and he was um, trying to get away from whitening policies that encouraged European immigration, that encouraged a whitening of the culture, and to kind of put African culture at a similar place um, as European culture alongside indigenous culture as well. So his idea was that Brazil was becoming more mixed, that they were creating a race that you could call the Brazilian race or the tropical race, and that race was better than any of its individual parts, right? Um, and so what I want to um, suggest here for this talk, though, is that beyond Freddy, there's a whole set of literature that um, comes up in the 1940s and 50s, mostly by US-based and, and, and French um, historians who are also adopting a very romanticized view, not just of Brazilian society, but of slavery in particular. So they come up with these ideas about um, Brazil being a sort of, cord having a cordial um, variety of slavery. And so there are many critiques of racial democracy. Among other things, scholars um, have pointed to the ways in which discourses of race mixture exist alongside all kinds of practices of hierarchy. Um, still others have explored how the project of mixture or, or mestizaje in Brazil was inherently gendered and sexualized, right, by um, centering both cultural and biological mixture between different roots of the nation. These were deeply, this is a model of nation making that's deeply dependent on sexual reproduction. Um, as anthropologist Kia Codwell has argued, embedded in racial democracy narratives was the idea that, uh, that black and mulatta women were expected to play a very particular role in the reproduction of the symbolic nation and in the self-realization of its intended subject, and that is property white um, Brazilian men, right? Yet both scholars that reproduce ideas of racial democracy and those that critique it have tended to focus almost exclusively on the internal processes that led to um, the kind of making of the Brazilian nation. But we also know that international dynamics or transnational dynamics also have mattered quite um, a lot, not only in constructing the idea of Brazil as a racial paradise, but also in legitimating and reproducing these ideologies. So the very construction of the Brazilian nation as mixed, um, we have to understand within a context in which ideas around um, race, science, and human progress are that are emanating from Europe kind of um, come, in, come into contact with all these different elites and they're produced through these discourses. And so from its very inception, the whole idea of Brazil as a racial paradise is all about the circulation of these kind of global ideas of anti-blackness, of, of that link race and heredity, um, and sort of, um, so they're trying to get out of the bind, the kind of modernity bind here. And so, it, so from the inception, the kind of imagining of a symbolic Brazilian nation, we have to understand is transnationally made. 
But what I want to do today is present a proposal that's from my, um, it's kind of a second book project, I'm hoping, um, that asks um, more kind of systematically how transnational processes figure into making the symbolic nation. Um, so it's very unformulated, it's very theoretically and empirically kind of um, in the early stages, um, but I, I, there's some thinking that I would like to kind of run past you guys. So, Stuart Hall aptly noted that the nation state was never simply a political entity. It was also a symbolic formation, right? A system of representation which produced an ideal of the nation as an imagined nation, uh, community with those meanings we could identify and with which through this imaginary identification constituted its citizens as subjects. And he talks about subjects in two senses, right? As the subject of and being subjected to the nation. Of course, this um, construction of this unified discourse of the nation in the context of these modern nation states is absolutely inherently a racial project. So in this research, I'm looking at this symbolic formation of the nation, that system of representation that Stuart Hall talks about, um, but in these kind of transnational spaces. So more specifically, I'm thinking about how we should think about or how we should like actually research um, the role of so-called outsiders or people who kind of um, who traverse national boundaries um, as these kind of central key figures in the um, in 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 the nation making process. Right? So thinking about them as constituting this nation making. So this transnational construction of the nation, I'm hoping, um, will be a, a sort of way, a way into all kinds of conversations about race and nation, conversations about nationalism. So more specifically, I'm thinking about um, analyzing a set of actors as these like couriers or, um, of, of nation, right? Um, who both make, but also reproduce, but also unmake the nation. And you'll, you'll understand what I mean by that. And I should say that in all of this, um, I'm not just, um, um, just you know, putting pictures of a scantily dressed Brazilian women on the screen. Like, I actually will have a race and gender analysis throughout the project. So, um, so how did I come to this project? So this has a lot to do with my first book that is um, in press right now. That's called Becoming Black Political subjects and um, in it I look at the kind of making the radical transformation um, to kind of race-based policies, ethnic-based policies for black populations in Colombia and Brazil. Um, and one of the questions I had in that project is how is it that Brazil goes from um, uh, basically um, calling black activists racist to institutionalizing affirmative action like within a few <laughs> years. So like how did that happen, right? Um, and um, the story that I end up uncovering is a transnational story. It is all about um, the Brazilian government's investment in thinking about itself as a leader in the world and in terms of race. It's all about um, black activists and particularly black activists, um, black feminist activists shaming um, the Brazilian government in these transnational spaces. Um, in such a way that required them to respond, right? They have to adjudicate these very different um, narratives of the Brazilian nation in places like Geneva, in places like Santiago de Chile, in places that black feminists um, from poor families in Brazil were not supposed to show up at, but they did. And so it was inherently this kind of story, and at the center of that story is the Third World Conference Against Racism um, that was held in um, Durban, South Africa in 2001, which of course our government here boycotted, um, but in Brazil it actually ended up being the basis for um, reparations actually, including affirmative action policies. So what I thought was really interesting about this particular moment um, in sort of um, the black movement in Brazil's history, but also the sort of Brazilian nation's history is that Ironically, in responding to the demands of black activists, the Brazilian um, government actually reaffirmed itself as a racial um, leader, right, as this model. And this was really clear when I talked to the head of the delegation to Durban, um, a very elite um, white Brazilian man who um, was a kind of human rights activist who had not done much on race before, but has now become very uh, much involved. And he told me of a moment at the end of the Durban conference, right? So he, 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 he explained the following. He said, we worked a lot in, on the Durban conference for reasons that don't have to do with Brazil exactly. It helped us, Brazil, emerge in that world of people with everybody happy, everybody singing, everybody understanding each other. In the context of this dispute between Palestinians and Jews, 
that thing that almost foreshadowed 9-11. And 9-11 actually happened right after Durban, which is part of the reason why in places in the world where it could have actually had an impact, it really just completely was overshadowed by um, the events of that day. So I think that what's interesting here is really about the resilience of the Brazilian state in remaking itself as a racial democracy, even, even in the context of it only doing so because of this kind of outside pressure from black activists. But I think it begs a bigger question um, that we don't talk about as much, which is um, how do we think about these transnational spaces, right? When we're talking about nation making, um, you know, to what extent um, can we sort of have a methodology where we analyze these moments as not some outside, but something that's kind of constitutive of this nation making process? So places like Geneva are just as important as places like Brasilia in, in articulating, affirming, and critiquing um, ideas of, of racial paradise. So the project Exporting Racial Paradise um, is, is intended to try to look at this. And the way that I'm thinking about it is to center the book around a set of actors who I'm thinking of as these transnational actors um, that are both constructing and reproducing but also contaminating um, racial paradise. And that's the kind of thinking about the role of the, the activist. So the approach is really like, it's a lot of things right now. I think it's like characteristically interdisciplinary, which is typically how I roll, but this is even more so because the historical period is like, I, I'm, it's like all over the place. Um, and so I wanted to share with you guys a little bit about the different chapters and maybe you can draw some lessons or you have some advice um, in terms of how, how this gels together methodologically. Um, so I'll go through the different chapters. So the chapters are diplomats, and so then when you do, you're like, okay, I have another book. This is a good thing. This is not um, a bad thing. And I had to have all kinds of, um, my friends call them um, burials. Like bur you like have this ceremony of burial for arguments and, and anecdotes and chapters that could not fit into the project so that you could just like heal and be like, it's okay, it'll be fine. So anyway, so this is one of those things that I um, have already grieved, but now it's like, come back. <laughs> so right after Easter, no. Okay. <laughs> so. Resurrection. Okay. <laughs> I was just, okay. I, I went to see Ivan Ailey last night. I'm sorry. I can't. It's, it's all in my brain. Right. Okay. Let me hurry up. Okay. So there, um, oh God, I forgot this is being recorded. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so the first chapter is, is data that I already have. It is all the stuff that kind of fell out of the book. It's statements from Brazilian diplomats and the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination within the UN. They say really interesting things about how they imagine um, the nation, and this is precisely why activists were able to critique something, because they're like, well, you said you did this. You said it was like this, but what about these statistics, right? Also interviews with diplomats, and I would have to interview a, a lot more. I only interviewed a few, but there's a lot of diplomats um, involved in this because the Brazilian government spent a lot of money um, in their anti-racist um, platform within the UN. And so I would interview a lot of the people who were at the head of that, many of which look just like these guys here. So the second, and this is the one I'm really interested in, um, is looking at the role of tourist agencies, but in particular, um, the airlines, because they sort of doubled as airlines and tourist agencies of sorts in, in the 1930s and 1940s. And I came across this archive at the University of Miami, which I feel like is just gold. So they have basically the Pan Am Air, Airways, all of their materials, including their internal documents, their marketing materials from, from 1927 to 1991. Oh um, and so that would be the first source, and I think that's probably enough for a book, but let's say it's not. Um, then there's also a second source, which um, also has archives, which is basically the Ministry of Tourism um, that started in 1966, Imbratur, um, in, in Brazil. And one of the interesting parts about looking at this within the 1950s-60s period, which is where I'm thinking as a sweet spot, actually, I, like, I think that's the time to kind of think about it. Um, is that um, that's the time when a lot of academics in the U.S. are writing about Brazil. It's also a military dictatorship, um, and it's a dictatorship that was the most um, set on institutionalizing this idea of Brazil as a racial paradise. And so I think it's fascinating that these things are coming out of a military di dictatorship for all kinds of reasons. So um, yes, so that's, the, that's that one. And the third actor is, of course, um, um, activists, black activists, and in this case, a lot of black feminist activists. And 
Um, the reason why I think that um, they're really interesting is because the way that they talk about the struggle um, is actually in terms that I think will actually end up perhaps being the, the theory that I put forward in terms of thinking about this, which is that they're not appealing to, like when they, when they go to the UN and they um, shame the government, they're not appealing to, they don't talk about it as appealing to an outside. They have this kind of way of understanding anti-black racism that is already inherently global. And so one of the things that I think would be interesting is to think about this whole idea of inside and outside and nation making um, and to kind of um, think about, like, break open this whole category and, and what the transnational actually means. So this is very new, but I would interview a lot of activists I've already interviewed. I would probably go back and talk more about other things that I, that since my topic was more like, how did affirmative action happen? How did affirmative action happen? How did it happen? Um, there are other aspects of Durban that I didn't get to. There's other aspects of Beijing. So a lot of the activists have been um, to Cairo and Beijing, all of the women's conferences in the 90s that were also incredibly important in terms of policy shifts in Brazil. And finally, um, the last chapter um, is something that I find fascinating. And I'm not sure who the actor would be per se, um, or if it would be everybody. But implicit in all this, and sometimes explicit, is this fetishizing of US-style racism, right? So in, it was Brazil's juxtaposition with Jim Crow and apartheid in South Africa that gave meaning to the idea that Brazil was actually racially evolved, right? It was the lack of anti-miscegenation laws in Brazil, that implicit, that explicit contrast with the US South in particular, that was essential to the production of Brazil as a racial paradise. So what I'm interested in doing in this chapter is thinking about how to get at that empirically. So you can find it in all of the narratives in the 40s and 50s, but the one way that I'm thinking this is interesting, I have this database of um, Folha de Sao Paulo, one of the major newspapers in Brazil, of articles from 1990 to 2012. And there are more articles about race in the US than there is about race in Brazil in that. So like, you know, any, Anything that happens in the U.S., it's like 20 articles on it. Like that Texas man um, that was dragged with that car, which was horrendous, had like 20 articles, though, about it in Brazil, right? O.J. Simpson, long after it was not news here, it was still news in Brazil. Um, anytime um, in Europe when there's any kind of like soccer player issue where they yell a racial slur to a soccer player, 20 articles, right? Like it's just a lot of, of thinking about other people's racial problems. And I think that this is actually another aspect of how this manifests. And so I'm thinking about going further back and seeing if that's a trend in the earlier part, um, in the kind of mid-century time period. So I'll leave it there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the new project. Um, Tiana, this is uh, specifically for you. Thank you both for the incredible presentations. Um, so as you know, like, I'm looking at militaries. <laughs> so I was thinking of where perhaps the Brazilian military itself fits in to this position. Of, I don't mean, it doesn't have to be like, oh, a fifth chapter or whatever, yeah, but yeah. also as kind of this propagator of um, racial equality or even through humanitarian work, particularly um, with the Brazilian military's insertion in Haiti after the earthquake, and um, because that was really the nation state that kind of stepped up the most to help um, with the relief, um, of course, causing a whole another slur of problems. But it is kind of the sense of we're helping our you know Latin American Caribbean neighbors, but also this um, you know historically uh, <clears throat> that has the image of you know black activism, black revolution, et cetera, and we're kind of helping our, our brothers in blackness. It also, um, even just like, uh, doesn't it have to be necessarily military, but like shipping, or you know, na nation state involvement, especially with like the emerging economies in Africa, particularly mm -hmm. like Angola and Mozambique, yeah. and the military's involvement with like petroleum extraction, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if you had any ideas. So. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good question. It's interesting because um, because of the period that I'm most interested in is um, one of the worst authoritarian right. regimes in the Western Hemisphere, right. um, the military dictatorship from the 60s to the 80s in Brazil. I, um, 
kind of feel like the military is everything, right? When the state and the military are sort of overlapping. Um, and so that, I think because of that, I haven't like thought a lot about the military, like when it's actually not uh, taken over the state by coup right. <laughs> and being its own kind of actor. Right. I mean, I think it's interesting um, because the diplomatic core um, of Brazil is one of the only sort of um, bureaucracies that's like very, like Weberian, like it actually has a professional structure and all these things. And so it's almost like um, the one place that if the military dictatorship and its logic did not like always apply, it, it would be to Itamarachi, to the right. foreign uh, ministry. But they were, they had a very um, strong hand on all the statements that diplomats made in that period still. Um, and so, I don't know, I would have to think more. I mean, this used to be like, eight actors, because I started to think, I was like, there's so many transnational actors. I was like, what about, um, you know, in the in terms of contaminating r racial paradise, I was like, what about all the Angolans and Mozambicans that live in Brazil and have to like, you know, so I had a chapter that was like, living in racial paradise, which they don't feel like is a late racial paradise, surprise, surprise, for all kinds of reasons of their own history and being black in places like Rio. Um, but then, I, you know, like there were a million chapters, and so now I've been just trying to cut it more and I have a feeling that once I get into the archives especially that this is going to turn into like a book on pale <laughs> am airways and I don't want it to be that but I feel it already because they're like we got a hundred boxes and I'm like ooh, a hundred boxes like okay I have my trip to Miami already planned out so I don't know so I mean I I do think I have to think about the military but if the military um, will be its own actor I'm not sure right yeah. I, I was because I don't even I'm I'm not aware of what the military's kind of positioning of itself was vis-a-vis -vis the um, independence movements in Lusophone Africa in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. So it was like throwing off the hand of colonialism, but still very anti-socialist yeah, at the same yeah. time. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, that kind of stuff will actually come up, and at mm -hmm. least the, on the diplomatic side, because, um, I mean, it's interesting. If you look at, you can see I mean, there's so many there's so many different struggles that one could pick up, but especially the kind of um, shaming of the apartheid regime within the UN. You right. see, and all the um, anti-colonial struggles is like muted, but it's in the UN document, and so it's absolutely in the conversations mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the elimination of racial discrimination because African independence movements are framing it at, within that language, right? right. And there's shadow reports and all kinds of stuff. So I don't, I have to um, think more about it, but I think that you're, that the military is key. And actually, um, I'm contacting a historian who's done some work on um, on the Brazilian foreign ministry in, on the African continent. Mm -hmm. um, he has this dope book um, called Hotel Tropico, um, Jerry Davila. And I'm gonna see if he has any other kind of archive, like how did he get the military dictatorship archives, basically. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, I know. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. So we have time for about two more questions, maybe yeah. two to three. Um, oh, other we don't end at two, we end at 1.30? Yeah. <gasps> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Rapid <laughs> fire. <laughs> um, I had, a, um, I had a, qu a quick question. I'm sorry, I thought there was a question over here before me, though. Okay. Um, I was going to ask for, you know, Rob, you talked a bit about the methodology, but I was hoping that maybe you can maybe share with us some of the um, things that you found in your dissertation research that you didn't have an opportunity to talk about. Oh, um, yeah. Wow. Um, I mean, I, 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 you can so identify yeah, one yeah, of the yeah, things yeah. that you want to share, but you want to create the opportunity to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give some highlights. You know, probably the most surprising discovery for me was the, and in doing the comparative research between Jamaica and Suriname, mm -hmm. was the very different uh, political approaches that both the Surinamese Maroon collectivity and the four Jamaican Maroon villages were taken, and especially Akompong. I mean, given the, the both similar histories, very similar treaties. The Surinamese um, um, Dutch actually modeled their treaties with the Maroons off of Jamaica um, in that period. And then not only that, but given the dynamics of resource extraction, like this was the same mineral as well, like the same bauxite was being mined, you know, in both countries. I expected a similar response to that. But whereas the Jamaican Maroons are responding to this latest threat by 
doubling down on their um, on their independence. Basically, they are calling themselves, and I actually wrote it on that little booklet that's circulating, the sovereign state of Akonpong in any publication being produced in the community. Um, they say that we have been around for some 300 years, this modern post-colonial, post-independent state, whatever you want to call it, of Jamaica has been around since 1962. Who are you to tell us <laughs> to do anything? You know, whereas in Suriname, it's quite the opposite. They're moving more towards political integration with the Suriname state as a form of protection and exercise of power as well. And they're very much doing it on their own terms um, in that sense. So unlike in Jamaica, the Surinamese Maroons have organized themselves into political parties. And at this point, with the most recent um, elections in 2015, they hold the balance of power now in, in Surinamese Parliament. It's an amazing comeback story. Yeah, and are now able to actually start setting terms you know, with the state, from within the state, on how development is going to be happening on their territory. So it's a very stark divergence there. I would say that was probably the most, one of the most remarkable findings that I found. Michael, I have a, uh, I guess it's more of a theoretical question, but for both of you, I'm sure you'll answer it different ways. Um, how you're talking about sort of nation um, seems to uh, trouble, I guess, how we think about sovereignty, um, particularly in relationship to, I guess, sovereignty and dependency, whether it's sort of dependency within this transnational world, right, or dependency, um, Rob, like, inside, like within and yet outside of, like, like a sort of nation state. And so um, I was wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about how your projects are thinking about sort of nation and nation state. Um, and, and what does that do with how we sort of think about what sovereignty even means? I feel like, I feel yeah, like well, I could, yeah, yeah, totally. No, it's a, it's a uh, good piggyback off what mm -hmm. I was um, just saying, you know. And one of the things I was careful not to do, um, especially in the case of Akampong, was to put a value judgment, you know, on their recent political trajectory and try to, you know, kind of pass judgment on how realistic that is. Having said that, you know, the, the Akampong Maroons, and you bring up the question of dependency, are not a viable, like, nation state as we would understand it in the Western model, right? I mean, they, they just don't have the kind of capacity to have their own independent international relations, for example, even though they are actually trying to forge that. And they are, at the same time, trying to, to build up and institute some of those trappings. So when I was there, I witnessed the unveiling of a national anthem that they created. They have their own flag, you know, that they're flying now and everything. And yet, of course, any maroon um, can vote in Jamaican national elections, any Maroon can run for office, and some even have in the past. Um, they travel on a Jamaican passport. So it's, 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 it's kind of, I mean, I think dual dependency, because from the, from the Jamaican state perspective, they're also dependent on the Maroons as a form of political legitimization as well within the cell. You know, Nanny of the Maroons is on the money there, is one of the national heroes as well. So, so whenever I'm thinking about this process, I can't help but recall one of the um, central stories in Maroon lore, which is the legend of Nanny and Sakesu. And these were two sisters that were captured in Africa, uh, according to the lore, and brought over Nanny and her sister Sakesu. Um, Nanny decided to flee the plantation, couldn't stand living under slavery, and 
went off and forged the Maroon Nation. Rasikesu was too scared to run and decided to stay on the plantation and became the forebearer of the non-Maroon Afro-Jamaicans, or Bongo Nation, as the Maroons would call it there. So we have these these siblings almost <laughs> living on the same island, you know, because of their the the uniqueness of their struggle. Um, the Maroons now see themselves as a different ethnicity and uh, and a different, uh, certainly a different political community, as well with all the rights that are um, inherent to that. Yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting because I'm I feel like I'm straddling the two projects, and so as, every time you talk, I'm like ah, <laughs> but like that's, those are similar issues, right? Around what sovereignty actually means in this particular moment, um, and and you know, like. Um, the fact that it is still worth fighting for, even if it's never actually going to happen under the terms that they actually want, right? Yeah. Um, but I think for this new project, nation is being disrupted in from within, but in a different way than that kind of nation within a nation kind of thing. Which is that I'm just starting to like think that like Brazil would only ever have to articulate itself as anything in a context where it's in. If there's some dialectic situation where they're like, there's a mirror of some kind. Like I'm starting to like rethink all of this. Like I'm just like, well, what what would Brazil be if the United States didn't exist? Like, like you know what I mean? Like racial paradise compared to what? Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know that there could be a racial paradise without a racial hell. I actually don't think that that is a thing. And so I, so I'm starting to like, it's just I don't know. It's in the beginning, but it is like. I'm starting to rethink everything. And I had already thought that like there was a permeability, at least politically, right, around the boundaries of the nation. I also knew that anti-blackness had no nation national boundaries, right? Like so I'd been thinking about boundaries being a, more fluid than I don't know, than some people would have us think. Um, but at the same time, like this there's I I still believed in them, right? And like, I guess lately I've just been like, oh, gosh, you know, like, you know, and, and when you look back, the foundational texts about race in Brazil, there's so much discussion of the United States. I mean, it, there's so much. I mean, Freddie wrote that book that is the foundation of the U.S. of, of the Brazilian nation um, in the U.S. South. Like he was physically in the U.S. South, and it's a similar thing. Jose Marti wrote his amazing like treaties on what it means to be um, American, right? And like the like the counter neo-colonial. Um, U.S. stuff in New York, so like there's just so much to be said about this like dialectic nature. So I don't know what that means in terms of nation, but I'm hoping that it'll sort of um, it'll sort of at the at the very least problematize the kind of like weird insularity um, that we um, at least in certain literatures, so certainly not African American studies, um, when we talk about um, nation making and nationalism and those kinds of things. Can I just uh, one quick response to that too, just just to <laughs> yeah. spark a thought on that. You know, one of one of the and also addressing what you asked Jarvis, one of the the conclusions I've also come to from my own research is that I think nowadays in Jamaica and Suriname we're dealing with what is effectively a plurinational situation. Mm -hmm. Although just the state hasn't caught up with that reality mm -hmm. yet, and therein lies the tension. There were we have multiple actually nations living within. Um, you know, a single defined kind of territorial body. Please offer our presenters a round of applause.